All right, guys, it's time for some fun with uh, math. And so today <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, the alternating uh, series test and then something called conditional uh, convergence. But first, let's just talk about what an alternating series actually uh, is. So it's basically just a series that goes plus, minus, plus, minus, or vice versa. So for example, um, the series is sum n equals... Uh, let's go from zero to infinity of negative one to the n. This basically looks like if you plug in zero, you just get out one. And then if you plug in one, you get out minus one. And then if you plug in two, you get out one. And then minus one plus, oops, <laughs> minus one. And then plus one and so on, right? So minus one plus one, it just keeps on repeating basically. And we call that an alternating We call that an alternating series because the signs are alternating. They're just going plus, minus, plus, minus, or vice versa. It could go minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So let's just look at some examples real quick of some alternating series that we'll be working with today. And so what we want to do is we're just going to do this first step here. We're going to write out the first five terms of each alternating uh, series. So here uh, we have this alternating series of sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n over n. And so you just plug in 1 here, and you're going to get negative 1. We'll show a little bit of work, just so you can see what I'm thinking. So you plug in 1, and you get this. And then plus, we'll plug in 2. So negative 1 quantity squared over 2. And then plus, and then negative 1 cubed over 3. And then plus, then we plug in 4. And just keep on going to get a feel for what's going to happen here. Of course, plug in the right numbers, and then plus one more. We need five terms of the series, so to the fifth over five, and then we put plus dot, dot, dot. And so at first, it doesn't seem like it's alternating, but once you calculate these negative ones, these powers, you're going to get uh, one. And of course, I put it in there. And to bear with me here, guys, it's early in the morning on uh, Sunday. So if I make a few mistakes, hopefully I catch them. All right, so here you're going to get negative 1 on top and 1 on the bottom, and then plus a 1 half because you're squaring the negative 1, and then minus 1 third, and then plus 1 fourth, and then minus 1 fifth. So clearly, the series is alternating. It's going minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, and so on. And so there's one nice little uh, example of an alternating series that we'll be working with today. And the second example, a little bit more challenging, we have the sum n equals 2 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, ln of n divided by n. You will notice most alternating series have this sort of negative 1 to the n in it. Sometimes it might be negative 1 to the n plus 1. Sometimes you may see it written as negative 1 to the n minus 1. This just kind of changes how you start minus, plus, plus, minus uh, type of stuff. So let's plug in here. And so now this one, we're starting at 2. So we have start with negative 1 quantity squared ln of 2 over 2. And so notice we're going to start with something squared, negative 1 squared, so it's going to be positive. So if you let me, I think we'll just skip this little step right here. And we'll write this as positive ln of 2 divided by 2. And once you know it starts positive, then you know it's going to go negative. So then negative ln of 3 over 3 and then plus ln of 4 over 4, and then minus, we'll plug in 5, and get ln of 5 over 5, and then plus, finally, ln of 6 over 6, and that's five terms, so we can stop and write minus dot, 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 because that's the next sign. And so, like I said, this negative 1 to the end is what actually makes it alternate. Okay, so now let's talk about this alternating series test. So what is the alternating series test? The first thing is you need to make sure that you have an alternating series. So your series has to be alternating. And then it has to have two properties, right? It has to satisfy two conditions, basically. The first condition is that the absolute value of the terms has to be decreasing as a sequence. So basically, what does that mean? That means basically the nth plus one term, the absolute value of it, has to be less than or equal to the uh, nth term. So, you know, basically you start here with, and we gotta put absolute value because we're looking at their, they go plus or minus, right? And so it's like a sub one is a little bit bigger, bigger, greater than or equal to than a sub two, which is greater than or equal to a sub three, which is greater than or equal to Oh, absolute value, a sub 4. And so that sequence just keeps basically going 
down. It's going to be decreasing. And so one way to show that is to work with inequality. So you show that the next term is less than or equal to the term before it. And of course, we're using absolute value again because our series is alternating. And the second condition here is we want to make sure the limit as n goes to infinity on the absolute value of these terms goes to zero. Right, so basically, you know, a sub one is getting closer to zero, a sub two gets even closer, and so on and so forth. So as you go out on your terms, and again, it's the absolute value of the terms, so you got to make them positive. We want to just make sure it's heading towards um, zero. And if that, the, and if your alternating series satisfies those two conditions, so condition one and condition two, then we can conclude that your alternating series is going to converge. All right. So before we talk about why it works. Let's actually do some examples. So let's go back here and let's re let's work on this these examples. So we're now we're going to use the alternating series test to determine if the series converge or diverge. So the first thing you want to do is just to write down what your absolute value of your terms are. So the absolute value of the a sub n's is going to be equal to, of course, the absolute value of negative one to the n over n, which of course is just equal to one over n. And so the first thing we want to do is what? We want to show that those a sub n's are actually um, decreasing here. And so how are we going to do that? Well, there's actually two ways you can you can do this. We can do this sort of just straight up. So we'll just set here and write down the absolute value of a sub n plus 1, which equals 1 over n plus 1. And that's clearly less than or equal to 1 over n. And why is that? So remember, I'm thinking to myself, well, what happens when you make the denominator smaller? So that's going to be less than or equal to one third for sure. That's a true statement. So this is a true statement, which, of course, that's equal to the absolute value of a sub n. So therefore, the absolute value of my a sub n's are decreasing. All right, so basically, I'm just saying that sequence is actually decreasing there. All right, so now what? My second step, I have to show that this limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value of a sub n's, what is that equal to? So the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n, of course that's equal to then one divided by infinity. And so I'm just kind of thinking here, make that equal sign a little bit better. And of course that's equal to zero. And that's it. So therefore, my series S, let's give it a name, S equal to that sum. So therefore, S is, or converges, is. So therefore, S converges by the alternating series test. So by the alternating series test. OK, let's look at the next one, because the next one's a little bit more uh, challenging. So over here, let's look at the absolute value of our a sub n's. What is it actually equal to? And so this is going to be the absolute value of negative 1 to the n times ln of n over n. And of course, that's just equal to you. And you really don't even have to do this step right here if you don't want to. But I like to do it just so you can see what I'm thinking. So ln of n divided by n. And so the first thing we want to show is that the a sub n's, or that you value the a sub n's, are decreasing. Now, this is a little bit harder uh, to show. The argument is not quite uh, so obvious. So what we want here, so I know what I want. I want the absolute value of a sub n, which equal n plus 1, which equals ln of n plus 1 over n plus 1. I want that to be less than or equal to, so that's kind of like the question mark, ln of n over n, because that's equal to the absolute value of a sub n. But that statement is not obvious. Right? So I have to create a, an argument. And the argument we make for this is we can actually turn these little a sub n's, these absolute value, into a uh, function. And so how do, we, how do we do this? So to say that this is a decreasing um, sequence, we can just let 
So we'll let f of x be equal to ln of x over x. And you know how to show that functions are decreasing. So think way back to calculus one. How do you show a function is decreasing? You take its derivative and you show that it's less than zero. And if its derivative is less than zero, that means the rate of change is negative. So it means the function is decreasing. So we'll let our function f of x be ln of x uh, over x. And then what do we have? So then we can take the derivative. So f prime of x, which is equal to, it's equal to what? So when you take the derivative, so it's just a quotient rule. So remember the quotient rule. So over here, I can write this down. It's going to be low d high minus high d low all over low squared and away we go. And so here's my low function x. So I write x times. Here's my high function ln of x. So times through ln of x is 1 over x. And then minus my high function, which is ln of x, times the derivative of my low function there, which is 1, and then all over low squared. So x squared, which equals 1 minus ln of x over x squared. And then we want to say when this is less than zero. So this is less than zero when. So this is less than zero when. When what? When that top part is negative. Because notice the bottom part's always positive. So when one minus ln of x is less than, I missed the x there. So ln of x is less than zero, which implies ln of x is greater than one, which implies, so when it's ln of x greater than one, so it's like, what do you plug in for x that gives you one? That's when x is greater than e, because ln of e is one. And so therefore, all right, so therefore, I have to value of our a sub n's, which is equal to basically what f of n are decreasing. And so, you know, on this problem, all you really have to show is I put this in quotes because you actually don't need to write that down if you don't want to. So this is just me thinking, like, what do I need to do? What I really need to write is define my function, take its derivative, say when it's less than zero, because there may be some conditions. So this one works for x is bigger than e. So actually, it's true for x. It's not true for x equal to 2, but it's true for x bigger than uh, two, but and that's okay. Your sequence doesn't have to decrease in the very beginning. It just has to decrease in the end, right? So in the very beginning, it's just a finite, um, it's just a finite sum, basically, right? So everything happens in the very uh, end. All right, and then finally, our second step here is what we want to show the limit as n goes to infinity of these absolute value of a sub n's is equal to. Well, what do we have? So the limit is n goes to infinity. And then, of course, this is ln of n over n. And we want to show that this uh, is equal to 0 to show this. Now, when you plug in infinity, notice you get infinity over infinity out because you have ln infinity on top and infinity on the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our good old friend, L'Hopital. So we'll L'Hopital this one. So we'll take it to the hospital to get fixed, and so the limit as n goes to infinity, and then we'll multiply, so on top we'll take the derivative, so that derivative of ln is one over n, and on bottom we'll take the derivative of n, which is one, and so this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n, which of course equals one over infinity, and that gives us our zero. So finally, we can conclude, therefore, and here, let me zoom out a little bit. So therefore, what can we say? So therefore, our series, let's give it a name. We'll call it S. So therefore, S, so we'll name it, converges by the alternating series test. Okay, 
And so notice the alternating series test is only a test for convergence. It doesn't really test for uh, divergence. Um, so our conclusion is always it uh, uh, converges if it satisfies those two conditions. All right, last thing. So we want to talk about what's called conditional. Oops, I lost my page here. I want to talk about what's called conditional convergence. So what the heck is conditional convergence? So this is a type of convergence that depends upon a condition. And the condition is the where the pluses and minuses exist on your term. So a series here is said to converge conditionally if what? If the series itself converges, but the absolute series, so remember that's just the sum of the absolute value uh, of the terms, diverges. So basically what it's saying is that this series here does not converge absolutely, but it still converges. All right, so think about that for a minute. So the idea is if I give you a series and then it the series actually converges, but the series doesn't converge absolutely, we say that series is conditionally convergent. Okay, right? because it depends, the, the convergence depends on where you put those pluses or minuses on the terms. So let's just go back and we'll take a look at our uh, examples real quick here. And so we want to prove that the series that we're given here converge conditionally, which means they don't converge absolutely. So let me come down here and then I'll write down here to prove this conditional convergence. So for conditional convergence, what do we do? We're gonna look at that absolute series. So that's just my little notation for taking the absolute value of the term. So this will be equal to the sum n equals one to infinity of, and I'll, I'll write this out this first time. So negative one uh, to the n divided by n, I slap an absolute value around it. So it's just equal to the sum n equals one to infinity. And that's just one over n. And this thing is gonna do what? This thing diverges because why? It's a P series. So it's a P series uh, with P equal to one, of course, which is less than or equal to one. So what does that mean? So that means, so therefore, so therefore, what? Therefore, S does not converge absolutely. So therefore, S converges conditionally. All right, so S converges conditionally. And just think about that for a minute, because I think it's nice to kind of just say, you know, what do you mean by conditional convergence? It means it depends upon the conditions of the pluses and minuses. So when you put minus plus, minus plus, and then minus plus here, that's forcing it to converge. Whereas if you had all pluses, it actually die. Uh, verges. So depending on where you put the pluses and minuses, sometimes you may get convergence, and sometimes you might actually get uh, a, a divergence if you have too many pluses or too many uh, minuses. All right, let's look at the next one. And so I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to make this a little bit smaller here so we can see a little bit more. And so we're going to write down here for conditional convergence. So conditional convergence, what do we need to do? Well, we need to look at that absolute series. We take the absolute value of S, which is equal to the sum, and this one starts at two, so N equals two to infinity. And then remember, we're just taking the absolute value of these terms, and so that's just gonna be ln over N. So ln of N, or ln of N divided by N, right? Now, this one's tricky. This is not a geometric series or a P series, so we're going to have to run a, a, a test on it. And so you have to figure out which test you're going to use. And if you look at this, typically, if you have a, a sum that involves maybe some E stuff or LN stuff, typically, I would probably guess 
And this is not 100% true, but I probably would look at that integral test uh, at first. And so this is an integral test problem. And so what do we want to do? We let f of x be equal to ln of x over x. And we note that this is positive and decreasing. Because why? Because, oh, and now I'm going to need my graphing calculator here, guys. You have to bear with me for a minute because I don't have that up. So ignore behind the scenes here. But I need to pull up this graphing calculator. So let me pull it up here. There we go. All right. So what do we have now? So I can graph this. So so on my graphing calculator, we can just graph it. Now, this one's nice because I let you on the integral test to show decreasing, just graph it. Now, on the alternating series test, you have to show your work. So that's something to note. So over here on my alternating series test, I don't let you guys graph things to show that they're decreasing. Uh, but on the integral test, I do allow it. And so here I have ln of x over x. And then I need to make my window. And I'm going from, um, you should go from 2 to 10, I guess. And then we'll zoom fit it. And so here, go down to zero, which is zoom fit. And hopefully you see it's positive and going down. Now notice it goes up a little bit. And so I need to have that behavior on there. And so right here, I will come down here, give myself a little bit more room. And so it's positive and decreasing. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but this is all I'm doing to argue this. So I go from two to 10 here and it starts up and goes down, sort of like that. And that's good enough, right? So I capture that beginning behavior, how it was up a little bit, and that's okay that it's increasing for a little bit, but eventually it does go down, and it's certainly always uh, positive. All right, so now that I have that, I can now look at my limit, or my improper integral, so I can look at the integral, and I want to go from two to infinity, of ln of x over x and see if that converges or diverges. And don't forget that dx there. And when I do this, you can either guess or check, or you could do u substitution, because I see a function as derivative. So I'll do u substitution. So u is equal to ln of x, and du is equal to 1 over x dx. Don't forget to change your limits. So u of infinity is actually equal to ln of infinity. And then we don't write that as infinity yet. We have to wait to the very end. So when we... to until we interpret basically and then u of one or u of two i'm sorry is equal to ln of two and so what is this equal to so this will be equal to the integral of from ln of two to ln of infinity and then we have basically we have this one over x which is one over ln of u oh i'm sorry let me split this up guys so you can see it better so integral from 2 to infinity of ln of x times 1 over x dx. Might be easier to see this way. And so here's my u. So I have u and then times, and that's my du right there. So there's my du. And so then that's going to be equal to, when you integrate this, we're going to add 1 and divide by it. So you have u squared divided by 2. You're going from ln of 2 to ln of infinity which equals basically just one half, and then we'll plug it in ln of infinity. So you get ln of infinity quantity squared minus ln of two quantity squared, which of course is equal to just one half times, and ln of infinity squared is just like infinity basically, right? Infinity minus ln of two quantity squared, which of course ln of two quantity squared is just a number, and so that's just gonna be equal to infinity. So, therefore, the series, the absolute series here, uh, diverges by the integral test. And so, what do we conclude for conditional convergence then? So, for conditional convergence, rewrite, therefore, S, which is our original series, uh, converges conditionally. So converges conditionally. So it depends upon the placements of the pluses and minuses, uh, basically.
All right, so let's zoom out just a little bit so you can see the big, big picture here. And hopefully you kind of notice, you know, every problem is, is basically the same sort of uh, setup. You do have that option of, are you going to show it's decreasing directly like we did on this problem uh, over here, which if you do it directly, it's got to be a pretty obvious argument versus are you going to use the derivative like we did right here? And when you use a derivative, you have to explain when it's, uh, less than uh, zero, but usually it's it's pretty. It should be pretty obvious. We, I try not to go too far outside of uh, uh, the box really on uh, on these. Um, okay, so one last thing I want to talk about, and that is what I want to talk about why it works, which I think is is important. It's important to understand why we need our uh, the absolute value of our terms to be decreasing, and we why we want that limit to go to uh, zero. And so here we're just gonna assume that we have an alternating series. So that's an assumption. And we will assume that the sequence of the absolute value terms is decreasing. And we'll also assume that limit is equal to zero. And so then what happens? And you've seen this phenomenon before. So let me just show this to you. Cause like I said, you've, you've seen this phenomenon before. So let's just say we have S sub one, this is our partial sums here. And so suppose it's equal to A sub one. And we'll just assume that A sub one is uh, positive. So if you have zero here and a sub one is positive, it's going to pop you up uh, over here. So this is my a sub one, which is my first partial sum. And then my second partial sum, what do you do? Well, you just add a sub two, but this is an alternating series. So if my first term is positive, my second term is negative. So it's going to pop down, but how is it going to pop down? Since the sequence is decreasing or the absolute value is decreasing, it's going to pop down, but it's not going to pop down as far as zero because it's a little less than that a sub one. So it might pop down right about here, let's say. And so this would be a sub one plus a sub two. Remember, a sub two is negative, but its absolute value is not quite as big as a sub one. And so this is your second partial sum. And then what are you going to do? Well, a sub three then will be positive because it alternates. So it's going to pop back up. And then remember, and let me use some, let me use some arrows here. So this is going to pop down here. And then you're going to add a sub three. We'll use blue for that. And so it's going to pop up, but it's not going to pop up as far as it's going to pop up as far as a sub two. Right. In fact, we could even this is kind of fun. We can even do this. this is, remember, this is just the absolute value of a sub two. We just went down. And so now we're going to pop up a little bit, and it's going to take us maybe right about here or something. All right, so we're going to pop up a little bit. And this will be our S sub three, which is just, you know, a sub one plus a sub two plus a sub three. And that length of that arrow is just absolute value of a sub three. And then it's going to pop down again. So check it out. Give me a good color here. Let's do purple. And so S sub four, you're going you're gonna to add the fourth term, but now the fourth term is negative because it was plus, minus, plus, minus. And so it's going to pop down here. So here's S sub four. It's going to go down this way. And of course, that's just, you know, A sub one plus A sub two plus A sub three plus A sub four. And then the length of that arrow is just going to be a sub, absolute value of a sub four because you just pop down that distance. And each time you're going to go back and forth, but you're going to get a little bit closer to some special number, right? So some little special number here. We don't know what it is. Um, we might call it just little s, but it's going to hop around little s going back and forth, back and forth. But all the little arrows are going to get closer and closer to zero because the the length of the little arrows is a sub four, right? So basically what's going to happen is that if you look at that definition, the limit as n goes to infinity of those little partial sums is actually going to equal that little s because what happens to the length of the arrows? The length of those arrows is basically equal to the sum of the absolute values of the not the sum, I'm sorry, but the absolute value of the terms, and the terms go to zero. 
And that's it. All right, so that's the idea. That's that sort of bouncing around argument, but bouncing around in a way that you're getting closer and closer because the way you bounce is going towards zero. The length of those little bounces are decreasing um, towards uh, zero, basically. Um, and that's actually why uh, it works. Okay, that's all I got.